Living by Design is partnering with the American Heart Association of Indiana, continuing our five-part Healthy by Design COVID series. Kathy Holloway Hill speaks with renowned neurologist, Dr. Karen Rodman. The longer they remain COVID positive, the more complicated their case was. Today on Living by Design. Living by Design with host Kathy Holloway Hill. Kathy is a strong, powerful voice. She entertains, informs, and inspires her audiences everywhere she goes. Holloway Hill and welcome to our COVID series continuation. I am so excited today because we have an incredible guest, very knowledgeable, Dr. Karen Rodman. She's a neurologist. She's my sister and I love her and I'm so excited about this (laughs) interview because we have so much good information to share with you from her perspective on this COVID situation. Dr. Karen Rodman, welcome to Living by Design. Thank you, Sister Kathy Holloway Hill and Brother Tony Lamont. Thank you for having me on your wonderful, wonderful show. Well, I appreciate it very much. And I'm going to just start off, Karen, by asking you to just give a little bit about your background. I know everybody knows you and we love you. But (laughs) since we're in the virtual world now, we may have some, (laughs) some new viewers. So just give a little bit about your background. Well, um, I am a neurology physician. I see adults. Um, And as a neurologist, I see people with strokes and seizures, things like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, migraine headaches, certain forms of chronic pain. I'm not a surgeon. And I went to University of Pittsburgh Med School and did my residency at University of Cincinnati for neurology and Cleveland Clinic for a stroke fellowship. So I sort of have an extra special... um, specialty in dealing with acute and chronic and long-term strokes and their treatment and potential long-term or short-term side effects. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we know we love you and you've been on the show many times on our Healthy by Design series. And I'm sure a lot of my viewers know you. uh, Thank you. They've written in about you a lot. So let me just start off by asking you Mm -hmm. on the COVID, as far Mm -hmm. as the COVID illness itself. That's now, right. I know that there are three, three main areas of the body that this COVID thing hits. Yeah. Uh, there, there's the, the uh, gastrointestinal, mm-hmm. there's the respiratory, and then there, there's the, the uh, neurological. And, you know, I didn't realize that loss of taste and smell was a neurological symptom, but, but yes. it is. Yes. So, because- so t- just talk a little bit mm-hmm. about each of those, especially the neurological aspects of the COVID illness and why we do not want to get the COVID illness. Okay, well, in terms of what you said was all true, COVID unfortunately is a multi-organ disease. Obviously the lungs is the primary source in terms of difficulty breathing, sometimes being on ventilators. It can also affect the kidneys. You can go into kidney failure. It can affect the heart. And of course, from a neurology point of view, it can affect both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. I think it's interesting, as you said, that taste and smell, which is cranial nerve one, and taste is cranial nerve seven and nine, can be affected um, by COVID, where they actually lose or get disordered taste. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the uh, little seminal things about the virus neurologically that can be affected. Unfortunately, from a brain aspect, a lot of people become delirious initially. Um, They call that encephalopathy. Some people have seizures, which I have seen personally. Um, Because COVID unfortunately can make you what we call hypercoagulable, meaning you produce certain factors like D-dimers, which make you clot. So you can clot in your legs, your arms. Unfortunately, you can clot in your brain. And when that happens, you can have strokes. Um, unfortunately it does, because it has access to the central nervous system, you can get meningitis, 
And then if, if infection involves the brain itself, they call it encephalitis. Meningitis is the, the meninges or the surrounding cells of the brain. Peripherally, and this is quite common during and after COVID, you can, it, because it can, it, it can uh, induce a, a, like an autoimmune immune or bad response in the muscles and the skeletal nerve, the, the skeletal muscle and ner peripheral nerves, you can get severe body aches and muscle weakness. Sometimes you can even get so, such weakness that you're weak in both arms and both legs. So those are the things we see. And unfortunately, you have the long hauler or post-COVID syndrome where, and the most common is where taste and smell can take weeks or up to seven or eight months to come back. Others have chronic fatigue, chronic cough. Some have chronic body aches. Um, others that I've seen will have, let's say, a certain disease like diabetes, which is normally well controlled, but um, after COVID, their diabetes is no longer well controlled. I've had patients who've had myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular disorder that neurologists treat. And one of my patients within a month after recovering from COVID, his myasthenia gravis is poorly controlled. So you have to think of those things. And even people with milder cases or moderate or severe can get post-COVID syndrome. So, so you, so you're, um, what I hear you saying is even mm -hmm. if you have a mild case that doesn't require hospitalization, mm -hmm. you can still have long haulers is issues. Yeah. Or post-COVID syndrome. And the most common one is people who've lost taste and smell, cranial nerve one, cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve nine. It usually takes a minimum of two weeks, but sometimes up to eight months for it to come back. And sometimes it's disordered. Wow. Yeah. Now, now let me ask you as far as the uh, loss of taste and smell, sometimes they say that's the, the first symptom that yes, someone may is. have. Yes. Does that mean if that's your first symptom that you now are more prone to the other neurological things like blood clots and, and strokes and, and that type of thing? Not necessarily. It depends how your course goes. I think once you, if you suddenly lose taste and smell and if there's no other physical or medical reason for it. You most likely have COVID. You want to be immediately tested um, and get the immediate, you know, whatever treatment, you know, the doctors recommend. Oftentimes after, now some people just get loss of taste and smell and some people get a little fatigue with it, but then it might take months to get their taste and smell back. Oftentimes after you lose taste and smell, then if you're going to have a more moderate to severe case of it, then you might start to get short of breath extremely fatigued, tired, body aches. Uh, if the shortness of breath worsens, you might have to be hospitalized and may or may not need to be put on a ventilator. Um, you know, if you do uh, get put on a ventilator, you'll be in an intensive care unit. Some people start to get, and this is the biggest thing, kidney failure, renal failure, who've never had it before. And then we need the nephrologist or renal doctor on board. Um, because you do produce uh, D-dimers and other clotting factors. You, when you're in the hospital, they have to watch you for developing clots in your arms or legs. And if, and if you do, they might have to put you on things like heparin. So it's a multifactorial disease and it's unpredictable because you have people who are young, middle-aged and old who can get it and survive and others who get it and they've been very healthy and they die. So it's, it's a disease we do not want to just dismiss as, oh, it's just the flu, because it is much more than that. Yeah, th this is so true. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to just ask you real quickly here, uh, mm -hmm. as far as um, I heard of a case where a guy had it and he struggled with it for months and he had to have a leg amputated. What, why sure. do you think that was? because he probably produced extra, unfortunately he developed what we call a hypercoagulable state, meaning he produced a lot of factors like D-dimer, fibrinogen and others, which caused him to develop very bad leg clots and they tried to treat it with blood thinners. Unfortunately, his was just so refractory, it was unsuccessful. And well, let me, let me let me stop mm -hmm. you right there, my sister, and we're going to take a quick break. And as you can see, this is a very, very informative discussion. So we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere.
Living by Design is sponsored by the American Heart Association of Indiana. Help us ensure everyone in Indiana has the opportunity to live longer, healthier lives. Hi, welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Karen Rodman, and I'm going to pick up Dr. Karen where I, I left right before the break. So I was talking about this gentleman who had mm -hmm. battled COVID for months and they had to have his leg amputated. So what do you think precipitated that? I think, unfortunately, this poor gentleman got the hypercoagulable, as I said before our break, state where he had multiple clots, in this case, in his legs. He may have had them elsewhere in his arms. And they tried the conventional blood thinners like heparin and Coumadin and Lovenox. And perhaps, unfortunately, he had pre-existing uh, risk factors for blood clots. You know, maybe he was a poorly controlled diabetic. Um, and what happened was, the clots could not be treated beside, despite aggressive medical treatment. Plus, he might have gotten gangrene or an infection in the leg as well, which unfortunately led to amputation. That's very, very sad. Yeah. Yes, that, that is. Now, let me go back to um, something we, we, we were speaking about during the break, mm -hmm. and that is the taste and smell. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you mentioned that sometimes... Uh, the taste and smell can be your first symptom, but then after you have recovered from COVID and you, you're kind of in the long haulers or, or you're still having residual stuff as a result of COVID, that the taste and smell can be distorted. Can you elaborate on what, that, what is distorted? Distorted or disordered means, unfortunately, for a, and usually it's a minority of patients who've had COVID and have recovered, for some, their taste and smell might take two weeks to six months, three months, eight months to come back, and it's fine. But for others, unfortunately, their taste and smell do return, but unfortunately, it is abnormal, meaning this. They, they'll say that, my, my goodness, I'm smelling garbage. I'm smelling things that are not there. I'm getting these foul smells. And then when I eat, my taste is... Is, is, dis, is distorted, meaning I'll eat something sweet and it will taste bitter or it'll taste like, my God, am I eating garbage? Am I eating, what am I eating? It tastes terrible. Now, can that be treated in and of itself? Well, it is a residual symptom of COVID? Well, what is happening is they are seeing ear, nose and throat and they're also seeing the dentist who are, you know, and again, um, who are trying to see if there is potential treatments for it. That is what my understanding for some who have disordered taste and smell following COVID. But there's no neurological prescription drug or no. medication? No, not at this time. Wow. Wow. Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, prevention. Uh, so we know that mask wearing is critical and we know that social distancing is critical until you get vaccinated. So if you wear a mask and you come in contact with someone who's not wearing a mask and they're asymptomatic, but they have their, they do have COVID, but you have on a mask. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're social distance and you're, you're like, six feet away from that person, but they don't have on a mask and they sneeze in your direction, what are your chances of, of getting the, the COVID? I would say if you're six feet or greater away and you are wearing the appropriate mask, I would say your chances are low. I'd say less than five to 10%. It's when you are not socially distanced, if you're not appropriately masked, your chances go up higher because, I mean, there's the e e eyes, ears, nose, mouth. And so if the sneeze gets close to the eyes or other areas, it would not be good. That's why, at, to reiterate, wearing the appropriate mask and being appropriately socially distanced at least six feet um, is important. And of course, if you're around someone who does not have a mask, you definitely want to be six feet or even greater away from that particular individual. Now, Dr. Karen, I, I want to talk about some of these asymptomatic people because I've been hearing a lot about that. Uh, they 
actually have COVID and they've tested positive for the antibodies, Mm -hmm. but they never got sick. They never had any symptoms. They never even had a mild illness, but they go get the antibody test and discover they have the antibodies. Why do they not get sick? What's the difference in them not getting sick versus someone else getting even a mild case? And basically, just to uh, clarify, they have tested positive for COVID with the nasal swab? Uh, Well, they never had symptoms, so they did not get a test. But they have antibodies. They didn't have symptoms. The only test they got was the antibody test, which came back positive. So what they need to do is get the nasal swab test just to verify that they have that they have it or they don't. Now, if they get the nasal swab test and it says they're COVID negative, that means they know they do not have COVID at that time. Now, perhaps they did have it and they have built up antibodies. Now, if they do get the COVID test after being testing the antibodies and their COVID test is positive, even though they are quote unquote asymptomatic, um, they are, it is recommended especially that they go to the hospital, oftentimes they can be admitted and still get the Decadron and Remdesivir therapy and still have to isolate for two weeks. What I'm essentially saying is the antibody test is good, but you've got to back it up with the nasal swab COVID test to see if you have it now or if you don't have it. Okay. Now, I, I've heard about people who have because they didn't show any symptoms, they didn't have mm-hmm. any illness, they didn't, didn't show anything, they just went about their daily duty. Mm-hmm. And then when this antibody test came out, they said, well, you know, I remember back <laughs> six months ago feeling kind of funny. Yeah. So they go and get the antibody test. They test negative for COVID, but the antibodies are there. So Which that means at one time they had it, absolutely. they got antibodies, but now COVID's gone. That's right. So they are now COVID negative. They now have antibodies. Now, six months ago or three months ago when they felt a little off, there's a good chance that they did have it. Why is that? What, is there any rhyme or reason to why some people are asymptomatic and, you know, some aren't? No, there isn't. Because you can have someone who's young and healthy who gets a mild, moderate, or severe case, like the doctor, a young doctor who was training to be a OBGYN, but she had to work in the emergency room. She was 28, healthy, yoga track star, and she probably got it during her work in the emergency room, and she got a horrible case. She was on a ventilator and never made it off and died, yet she was as healthy as anything. That is what makes this disease so insidious and dangerous. Now, yes, older people with more pre-existing conditions are more likely maybe to have a more severe case, but that's not necessarily the case because a lot of the people who get COVID-based strokes and neurologic problems are 50 or under. Excellent, excellent. We're going to take another quick break, and we're going to be right back with more information on our COVID series. (laughs) Living by Design is sponsored by the American Heart Association of Indiana. Help us ensure everyone in Indiana has the opportunity to live longer, healthier lives. Next week on Living by Design, Kathy Holloway Hill sits down with world-renowned psychologist, Dr. Richard J. Davidson. There is no question that this has been a very challenging period for people all over the world. Next week on Living by Design. Welcome back. I am here with Dr. Karen Rodman and Dr. Rodman during the break we were speaking about um even if you're not sick and you just go to your doctor for for a checkup or you go to the hospital for another procedure unrelated to covid that it's it's traditional to just right well now in these days and times that it's traditional to just get a get a a covid test can you elaborate on that absolutely in our my hospital i'm working at and in many they are testing everyone who's being admitted to the hospital for whatever reason for covid And that's very good because you can trace, isolate, and treat. And let's say you came in for a hysterectomy, or let's say you came in for your blood pressure being high. If you're COVID positive, you will go, even if you're asymptomatic, you will be in an isolated, appropriate room, negative air pressure. You will be treated with Decadron and Remdesivir intravenously for COVID for at least three to seven days. Um, in some places, they do some of the monoclonal antibodies like uh, uh, Casarivumab, 
and Bem Liv Nivumab. I'm sorry, I am ma I'm macerating those names, but they are infusions that they can treat you with. So that is important. And even if you say, well, I'm feeling great and they discharge you from the hospital, because you've tested positive for COVID, even though you've gotten treatment in the hospital, you must go home and isolate for another two weeks. And this is key. At the end of those two weeks, you must take consecutive back-to-back -back repeat COVID tests to make sure you are now COVID negative. Because for some people, and it's usually, I'm sorry to say, for people who have more severe cases, and I unfortunately have treated one such person, they remain COVID positive for anywhere from three to eight weeks. And of course, the longer they remain COVID positive, the more complicated their case was. They usually were on ventilators. They usually ended up having renal failure, kidney failure. They had neurologic symptoms like seizures or confusion. One had meningitis. And ironically, when they were finally COVID negative and were fully treated and were able to go home, unfortunately, and a lot of people don't know this, the COVID caused an inflammation of the heart and they were readmitted, even though they were now COVID negative with a heart attack and they died. <gasps> yes. Wow. Because it caused complete heart failure. Wow. So um, it's a disease we must take seriously. Um, you know, they are starting to see, I just wanted to mention the long hauler syndrome in some young children, maybe ages six to 15 who've had COVID. They've had relatively mild cases, but afterwards they're getting dizzy. Um, some are saying that they get very fatigued and tired easily. And these were healthy children. They have to take breaks. They have to sit down. They have to rest. They feel more short of breath, almost like, well, now that they're free of COVID, it's almost like, well, maybe they have some asthma or some other airway disease. So it's a disorder that must be taken and treated seriously. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Karen, let's talk for a few minutes before we run, have, still have time left about some of these variants, the African variant, the UK uh, variant, yes. the Brazilian variant. Now they're coming up with another variant, a fourth variant. So are the, are you, are, are doctors seeing these variants as more transmissible and more deadly, or are they kind of on the same level as the they, They're, they're oh. being seen as more transmissible. So, I mean, and because they are more easily transmissible, it becomes even more important now that hopefully we're at the finish line and maybe within the next four to six months, we can get back to a more normal existence. It's important to still wear your mask, to still appropriately socially distance, and to please get your vaccinations, be they the Pfizer, Moderna, or the Johnson & Johnson. It is key. Um, yeah, so those are the three. I don't know about AstraZeneca. Are they even? Well, AstraZeneca is having some communication issues. At first, they weren't sure if AstraZeneca may or may not have caused a clotting problem. Then they were saying, well, maybe it's not as efficacious in people who are over 65. So they're unfortunately still working out, um, I don't know if you want to say they're bugs or, or working on their data. Um, I know in the U.S. it has yet to be approved. So right now it's Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And I recommend getting any of those. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, for this younger generation, which <laughs> I, I don't, I'm going to ask you, is, is that what we're seeing more of now in the ICUs and the new cases between 19 to 50? That's what I heard because they are now the group that, is, is are getting sick and not the 60 and 70 year olds or well, 80. I think a lot of the college age and people and into young individuals in their 20s are maybe flouting not doing the masking as they should and more importantly they're gathering in large groups without social distancing like strength. and without vaccines without vaccine and without masking. And whenever you do that, like when they go on spring holidays and they're at the beach on mass and no one's masked or, or socially distancing or be, being vaccinated, that's when you start to get the reemergence and, 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 and reactivation of more cases because you know people are just so tired of it and it's understandable, but we're, we're in close to a finish line and it's not the time to drop 
all of the precautions. And let me just ask you this one quick question before we say goodbye. So as long as COVID keeps hanging around, we've already got four new variants. Will there be more variants as long as we keep this going and new cases continue to rise? Well, viruses and bacteria always develop new variants because they, I mean, that's how they evolve. Um, I think once, if we get people to at least 75, hopefully maybe up to 85% or greater vaccinations, and now they're starting to do some testing in children who are, you know, 10 to 12, I think we can finally get a handle on it. And obviously with the monoclonal antibodies, the one, the names who I'm sorry, I macerated a bit, those are going to be important treatments too. And they're usually given as uh, inpatient or sometimes outpatient infusions, but we have to be careful. And obviously the scientists and virologists are studying these variants to see like they do with all viruses you know, or bacteria, what causes the mutations and how can we effectively treat them or stop them? Right. And as long as it's around, we're going to see more variants and more variants. Is that accurate? Possibly. Okay. okay. That's, that, that's good. That's good. Immunologists that's good. are infectious disease. Okay. Because I think there'll be a limit to the number of variants. But I think the key thing is we need the vaccinations. And if any other companies come out with appropriate vaccinations for, for now or the future, that'll be wonderful as well. Okay. All right. Dr. Karen Rodman, you heard it from the expert herself. Dr. Karen, thank you so much for joining us for this very powerful COVID series episode on the Living by Design show. We thank you for joining us for this episode. We will see you same time next week with another empowering show. Good night, everyone.